Right, this is Leah Wicket. I am a grad student here at UC for history. I will be interviewing um, Jean Lewis. My partner is Tao Nguyen, who will be recording this interview for us. So let's get started. Um, so can I just get your full name? Your full name? Jean D. Lewis. Okay. Uh, and where and when were you born? Uh, February 20th, 1931 in Gold Bear Zone. Okay. And your parents' names and their occupations? A. E. Lewis father, labor, uh, mother, May Lewis, housewife. Okay. And um, where did you attend college and what was your focus of study there? Uh, Arizona State College, which is now of course a university, the largest public university in the country. Uh, BA, MA, and I studied uh, history. Okay. And what was your focus that you did in history? In history? Mm -hmm. In America. American. Okay. Um, and the date and the circumstances of getting hired here at UC and why you chose UC? Uh, I came in 1958 and I had done my uh, dissertation, uh, which was finished just a year before, on an early American engineer uh, concentrating between the period of 1820 and the Civil War, the skill of the Civil War. And the College of Engineering here had been given notice that their accreditation was in danger unless they uh, diversified the curriculum a bit, uh, away from the technical side to more human, uh, humanities, social studies, uh, etc., business. And uh, because we were on a different calendar, they did not intermingle with the College of Arts and Sciences. So technically I'm the budget of the College of Engineering, although my office was here in, uh, in McMicken Hall. Um, that soon changed in 1963, but I taught over there for five years, totally, to engineers. Uh, taught them American history, Western Civ, and in the, their senior year, all of them in one class, 200 of them, in a course called Contemporary Problems, which focused on the 20th century. Um, and then what positions did you hold here at UC other than professor? Oh, I was assistant to, uh, executive assistant to the president, President Warren Bennis, and I was uh, senior vice president and provost of the university in the 70s. And I was department head in history for probably different times, 12 years. Um, and then what date were you tenured here and what was the process like at that time when you were tenured? Tenured or when I arrived here? Uh, well, both, if you want to talk about Oh, when I arrived here. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were a very small and very, very isolated uh, in terms of national identity as an urban university. We were supported by the city of Cincinnati. Um, quite small. I think we had uh, five or six uh, teachers in the Department of History. In the hall, hall of third floor McMicken where we're sitting now, we had about five or six departments, some in business college. Um, it was not diverse. I was interviewed by uh, five or six older white men. Um, and that was it. There was no affirmative action. They had already decided to uh, hire me before I got here. Uh, I arrived at the airport, no one there to meet me. I uh, said, well, it's Cincinnati, I have to stay overnight because my appointment's for the next morning. I had to find my way to the hotel downtown. After I went to bed that evening, I uh, remembered I didn't know where the university was, so I got up and dressed, went down to the, <laughs> to the lobby to the desk and ask how do I get to the university. They said you can take a bus out here. And Dr. Reginald McGrain was the department head at that time and he was to retire the next year or so. But required retirement by age in those days. And he said be here at eight o'clock. Well I caught the <laughs> caught the bus up to the front of Clifton, asked where McMicken Hall was, it said up there. I had his office number. Came up, I was here sitting on the floor in the hallway, and he wobbled in. <laughs> he said, uh, I'm busy teaching. 
go do something, meet us at lunch in the student union. And we had an interview of about 10 minutes, nothing about me. <laughs> I didn't even meet the dean of the College of Engineering at the time. And then we went to the president's office. And he came out and shook my hand. He and Richard McGrain went in and talked for 30 minutes. Turned out they were talking about a book they were <laughs> doing together. <laughs> and when I came out, maybe 132, he said, well, my machine isn't running right, so you have to get back wherever you're going. <laughs> so I walked down the hill, caught a bus back downtown, and bus to the airport, and that was my interview. <laughs> And that probably is pretty symbolic of the state of this university at that time. Um, I, practically all the rest of the early hires in the next two or three years for graduates of this university, not the PhD, but bachelor's and MA, and no, no really interview process. Okay. There's dramatic change yeah. soon after that. Do you remember when you got tenure and what that process was like? Uh, yes. Okay. There was no process. <laughs> it was the department ahead looked around, thought, well, he, he needs to be tenured, or she, it was always he at that point. He needs to be tenured. So in 1969, oh, tenure. Now, I was talking about promotion full professor tenure. I learned about it, I just think I was tenured in 63. And I learned about it a year later almost. It's not important. They're not going to get rid of, get rid of me. <laughs> and when I was born to full professor in 69, I found about it uh, through the newspapers. No process whatsoever. That was the change, too. <laughs> Do you, um, can you, you talk a little bit about the courses that you taught while you were here and how teaching for you and for the university changed over time as you were here? Um, I taught a variety of courses, obviously, from Western Sales to 20th Century to uh, an engineering college. When I came here, I taught altogether American uh, survey courses, and I developed uh, several courses. I taught Civil War for a few years, Reconstruction. I taught um, the Jefferson Jackson period. I taught the Old South. Um, how did that change? Well, when I came back from being a provost, they had seen I <laughs> taught contemporary problems in engineering, so they assigned a world history course to me. It was mostly U.S. <laughs> and its interaction with other countries, not really world history. And uh, uh, I taught a, a survey occasionally, large classes. Remember. We had about a thousand students, and uh, I co-taught with um, Tom Bonner in Wilson Hall, 69, 70. In fact, we were teaching in 1970, and students you know, broke up the classes around the university and the protest over Kent State. And then I developed the course in Jackson and uh, Jefferson. But primarily after I became head in the 90s, I taught one of those courses occasionally, but I taught uh, historiographical seminars, and that was a way for me to keep up with what was going on in American history and really coming to understand better uh, American history that it often, so often, probably correctly so, reflects the time that you're writing, and if it's a time of, of, of adversity and inclusion, uh, then it turned more to social, cultural history, and that is reflected. Um, the early period of professional history, maybe not quite as early, the Beard period, was all economic. Everything was based on economic conflict and so on. And then after the World War II, it turned more to a type of consensus history. And then with the, uh, the great changes in the 60s and 70s, it became much more pro progressive, conflict-oriented again, but on the progressive side, um, and, and so on. So that's why history can never be written just as 
uh, once and that's it because it, it reflects those who are living they go back and examine what preceded this what caused this and so you see women suddenly are entering American history and it, they had been blotted out all those years and uh, same with uh, African Americans and, and other groups except for that yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great um, so what was your educational approach in teaching um, so do you recall any of the um, activities you did in course? Was it was it lecture heavy? Do you remember uh, your uh, teaching style? Oh, and cl classes are largely lecture because the classes were big. Uh, the advanced courses we had discussions, uh, and in the survey courses we broke up and had uh, 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 graduate assistants usually conducting uh, discussion section, discussion section. You lecture only maybe twice a week and then on the third time you'd have discussions. I don't know what they do now. Pretty much the same. <laughs> uh, but I understand enrollments are down and, and 127 was occupied all the time with John Alexander teaching up to, I think it holds 180 students there. I don't think we do that anymore, so I don't know, but uh, you do. <laughs> okay. Um. So you were involved in um, some of the programs here on campus as well, in the History Department, um, the Student Budget Committee, it looked like in your paperwork that you were a part of, of that a bit. Um, do you recall any of those organizations and, and departments? Uh, there were committees in the department, okay. that's true. But speaking more generally, I was thought budget problems my entire career here. We never had, and maybe we're not terribly unique, but I think we're unique in Ohio because we were starving for funding and we waited to become a state university 15 years too long. Um, when I was provost, yeah, right, I ended up being provost just as we came state. We, we were terribly broke, and the problem was trying to bring this university into the at least the 20th century, if not the late 20th century, was uh, trying to hire new deans. And that was my role. And it's very hard to attract a uh, top-notch dean here that you really want without any funding and money. <coughs> and of course, it was in that late period of promotion time that we uh, became unionized because of salary problems. Um, and then when I became department head, Uh, for a long period of time, 88 to 98. Um, the dean promised that when I had retirements, we'd get two replacements for the one who retired. That would have two secretaries. And there was something of a little recession. We had those every three years at the university in by 91. And then one secretary that we had retired, we never got another one. That places an awful lot of burden on one person and uh, the head to, to fill all those chores that you have to do. Um, we never got two replacements for one. And in fact, back to the secretary thing, I've often wondered what we did wrong there. And the importance of the dean's role at that time, the dean has been demoted here a lot now, but at that time, they controlled the budget totally. He was from chemistry, and I learned that they had five secretaries of general funds when we had one. And that's, you know, you fought budget all along. And within about the same time that the secretary retired, he sent out a note that we had to make cups. Well, where do you make cups in this department? And the budget is 95% personnel, faculty. Um, all you can cut is a bit of paper and maybe a computer or two here or there, but that's it. 
You know what one thing that he made us cut it? You know what we had to cut? We had to jerk out a, a third or two thirds of our telephone. That's my role in terms of budget. Uh, it, it, it makes you grow old quicker. You know, kind of fighting constantly. And I spent much of my time either teaching or doing that. And in the university, you've got to view it as a community. And But occasionally within the community, you have some top-down stuff. And the top-down was the budget. You had, you had, they kept it secret of what other departments did, and divide and conquer, in a way. Um, and I understand now that what they've done is, in the last five or six years, they've fired all of the business part of the Arts and Science College. And the budget is over the provost office. Now that is really top down. And probably there are not great discussions over where we should be going at this time, what direction we should be going. But in the main, I support what they're doing now. It's diversity, inclusion, interdisciplinary. And that's hard to accomplish all those without a lot of resistance. And in some cases, it, it's desirable to resist if, it, if the purpose does not for their education. You have to look at that closely. I probably talked more than you wanted to. Okay. Um, so do you remember being an advisor on any committees? Because it, uh, like maybe Cincinnatus or fraternities or, or anything here on campus? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I don't know whether you walk to the unit. There's, a, there's an award called the Barber Award. Dean Barber was the dean of the college for years. He had only left a couple of years before I uh, arrived. And when he retired, he set up a, a fund, the Barber Award, for best student-teacher relations. And because of all my in engineering, I uh, didn't have much to do with the department here, although they tried to integrate me in the department a good deal. I spent my time with the students to the organization and tried to advance them. And the second year I won the Barber Award after it was uh, inaugurated in the 60s. So I spent a lot of time and I noticed that it's interesting. The last thing I think that Professor Zane Miller, you've heard of it, mm -hmm. ever wrote was a birthday card to me a year ago. in uh, uh, 10 or 12 days and he wrote in there he was the best mentor of undergraduate graduate students I've ever met so that tells you a bit of my work there I just away from the question I'm afraid okay. um, so you talked before in our other interview a bit about uh, your work with going to the march in, um, during uh, the Civil Rights Movement. Would you want to talk a little bit about that? The Selma March? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that began, and, you know, education comes in many forms, uh, human relations and knowledge. I grew up in a rural area of northern Arizona. Uh, Tempe, where Arizona State is located, it's a suburb of Phoenix. Probably had four or five thousand students I went there. Uh, Northern Arizona had a reservation near Apache Indian Reservation, 20 miles away. My interaction with that group was minimal. We had none of them in our schools, great schools. I had no interaction with uh, Latinos. Uh, uh, that was the southern part of the state. And so when I left Arizona State, I, I bet I hadn't met a dozen African Americans in my life. And I told in that interview about coming <laughs> from Globe, Arizona, to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois on a Greyhound bus back in 1953. 
and taking 24 hours to go across the state of Texas in those days. <laughs> Got to Tulsa and my first experience with such obvious racism. One of the fountains, water fountains in the, in the bus station, colored and white. And my interaction with an African American who was a graduate student at Illinois and how he was discriminated against. And it was no awakening. But when I came here in 58, I met the enrollment of African Americans at this university was a hundred. Would have been something. Um, the African American community was largely located in the West End at that time. And it was clustered there. It seldom got out. What started to spread them was the development of I-75 that was finished in about 59 or 60 through there, cut out the whole community, separated it. Um, and so my interaction with black people grew slowly but steadily. And what happened, of course, was the arrival of Martin Luther King in the 60s. Um, his ultimate assassination in 68. And a president from all places, Texas, named LBJ that was able to push through the Civil Rights Act, voter, voter integration, voter, voter rights, and so forth, uh, accommodations. And the voter rights thing was terribly important to American historians. They had been fighting, talking about this for a good deal of time. And the leaders in the profession, including C. Van Woodward, Richard Hofstadter, and others, decided that we would join him and Martin Luther King in a march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama in 65. And Tom Bonner, a hero of mine, and did more to cause this university to transition to a modern university than anyone. I remember King, he came here in the fall of 63. And Dottie and I had just gotten married. We lived down here in an apartment in Woodside Place, and Tom Bonner became chair of the department. Well, we came together quickly in terms of interests and outlook, political affiliations, and so on. And I remember him sitting in a chair at that apartment on Woodside Place where the business college is now. Um, after John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So we had grown very close together. And in 65, I still remember him. We lived in Amberley Village at that time. Why we went out there, I, oh, I do know why we went out there. <laughs> it's a largely Jewish community. And the fellow talked the Romance languages on this hallway, in this hallway. We lived out there, and he took a job elsewhere. He said, Gene, I'll help you buy my place. I'll provide a second mortgage for you and everything. That's why we were out there. <laughs> just getting started. And Tom Bonner came out there and said, would you like to go with me on that march? And I said, oh, yes. Yeah. What an what a experience that was. We flew to Atlanta, got in there just about dark, and some old yellow church buses driven by black folks met us there and drove that night to Tuskegee and stayed all night there the next day. We didn't walk all the way from Selma, that's probably 45, 50 miles on the outskirts we met. And they, they said, this is a peaceful march. There's no protest in terms of yelling back at these rednecks who were yelling and screaming at us. And we were protected by the National Guard, it was there. And I remember walking hand in hand with Richard Hofstadter. If you don't know who Richard Hofstadter was, <laughs> he's one of those consensus writers back in the 50s and 60s, you should look him up. Um, and we marched hand in hand, and these gay moves from all around yelling obscenities to us. We got before the old Confederate capital in Montgomery about 
about say 10 or 10 or 11 o'clock that morning, these black folks, we call them blacks, you know, they're African Americans now, uh, had waited too long to be in front of that old Confederate place, and they weren't about to quit early. We stood there, and it was in late, middle of the late March, it was hot in Alabama by that time, for three hours without any water or anything, and listen, Martin Luther King, of course, spoke. John Lewis was there. You've heard of him, I hope. He's a congressman from Georgia, John, John Lewis. And then when we disbanded, they said, get to your buses quickly. And Tom and I stopped in the Gulf of the States, can we use your restroom? They said, no, you can't get out of here. And we jumped in that bus and got back to Atlanta that night. In the meantime, a woman from Michigan that was driving back to Selma that night was hijacked and killed. That became national attention. That was really a, a, a great experience for me. And then in 68, 69, we had the uprising here, uh, UBH, the United Black Association. We had really grown as uh, numbers of African American students. Imagine coming in with an old fogey white president, <laughs> conservative, <laughs> and I was president of the AUP, that's the Association of American Professors, and was, we were trying, and Tom Waters helped, trying to get some way or another that faculty, students, and administrators could come together and discuss these problems that we were facing. And they were numerous. And we finally got a university senate set up where there were students and faculty about equal numbers, administrators much smaller, uh, to discuss these issues. And I was elected the first president of that. And a month later, Kent State occurred. We had to uh, shut down the university because it was just unheard of. We worked so hard in all sorts of discussions and, and sessions and seminars on bringing us together so that we could reopen. And the University Senate met that uh, to reopen the next day on Monday, late in the middle of May, so we were on the course system of schools and on forever, into June graduation. And we met to decide if we could reopen the next day. In that very afternoon, Jackson State, you know, uh, all African American University in, in uh, Mississippi had great riots, and African Americans here on campus demanded that we respect the same way we did Kent State. We closed down, <laughs> and we voted to. And then we had to convince Langston, and he wasn't even there, so we got in our cars, Tom Bonner and I. He was provost at the time, and I was chair of the University Senate. Went down to his house on Captain Avenue. And Mrs. Linkson got word that the African Americans were coming down there. And she yelled out all sorts of sympathies about them and get out of here. And we went down to City Hall. At that time, the, the university was still urban, and the mayor was there. The trustees met. <laughs> Thanks a month to let Tom Bonner and me in the room. So we sat out in the lobby of City Hall while they were debated there for two or three hours and came out and there's no way that we could reopen it. So it was closed. So that's, I don't know what the question was, but <laughs> no, that's great. On and on. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, that, and you talked about it. So you didn't talk much about, um, would you mind talking a little bit about the Vietnam War protests here on campus? Yeah. The reason, of course, I got the footage that it did was because young men were drafted those days. And it was no worse. It was a hell of a mistake than the Iraq War was. The Iraq War doesn't generate that kind of protest on campuses. Why? They don't draft people. It's all volunteers. And the Vietnam War, it was escalated. We had the terrible 68 presidential election where LBJ had dug himself in. He, 
you know, LBJ was a great president until he turned to Vietnam. He didn't know anything about foreign affairs. He's got us into that jungle. And they confuse what we call a domino theory with nationalism. True Vietnam was communism, but it was not communism that China could take over. It was nationalistic communism. You understand what I mean by that? That it, there, it, it was more nationalist than communist. And China was going to move in, we're afraid, after the Korean War. And we we're going to go in there and free North Vietnam. And, uh, well, at any rate, the riots were terrible here. And um, we, uh, Tom Bonner and I, organized a peaceful protest. And it was peaceful that we walked all the way downtown. Um, and we had a lot of booze on the way down there. And I remember someone put up on Tom Bonner's back before he noticed it, a uh, friend of North Vietnam, that, was, and that type of thing. And several faculty were arrested, not several, some, one in our own department. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Herbert Shapiro, maybe you've heard of him, taught after American history. And Tom Bonner and I bailed him out. <laughs> so that was the type of thing. Uh, and I remember one of our vice presidents, Ralph Bersick, a real gentleman, vice president of finance, had a lady secretary had been here in 30 or 40 years, and she was very outspoken. She came in that morning and the students had occupied the administration building. <laughs> and right next to her office was the men's restroom. She took a broom in there and cleaned it out in no time. <laughs> Get out of here! <laughs> so there was some humor in it all too, but it, it, was a, it, was, it was not an easy time. Um, do you recall at all if, if the Watergate scandal or the resignation of President Nixon was something that affected campus at all? I was executive assistant to the president and there was nothing going on in terms of usual protests of that. I remember one protest that I, the first job I had as, protest, as, as provost was going to Sanders Hall, which is not here anymore, because they blew it up. <laughs> it was not safe and trying to calm the resistance there. But no, I don't think the national events in the 70s upset the university that much. I could be wrong, I'd have to go back and think about it. <laughs> you know, you have to take some of this with very caution. You're talking about stuff that occurred 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so, as far as your living here uh, near campus, what was that like? What was your uh, impression of the transportation system at the time? How did you come to campus each day? Um, so what was it like? living near campus and working at campus for you? I did always live near campus the okay. first several years. Um, I did. I lived on, I was not married then. I lived on Probasco in two places. And then I moved out to Western Hills. Uh, I shared an apartment with a fellow who's kind of a good friend. Uh, became a professor down at North Carolina University and has a very distinguished family lived out there and <laughs> I drove little foreign cars at MGA. I, mean, and I talked to those engineers at 8 o'clock in those days. And I remember coming in down Western Boulevard and there was a little hill there. This was the days before uh, front wheel drive on cars. It was snowy and snowy, much worse than it was this morning. And I came up behind the woman in a car that got out and shoveled, um, she was stuck, shoveled under her front wheel and got in the car and drove off. I told that to those engineering students. <laughs> they're, st they're still remind me of that. <laughs> that really tickled them that th this occurred. And then we lived in Amberley Village, as I told you, uh, for six years. And I, we moved into the place where we now live when I came to Provost. Couldn't fight that I-75 every morning. So we have lived in 
Cliff all together almost 50 years. And then did you bus here for, when you lived in Clifton, did you bus here or did you still drive? No, there's no buses. No. <laughs> oh, damn it, really. I'm sorry. Let me, let me turn this on. Sorry, Scott, I'll call you back. I have to leave this on because my wife is recovering from a knee surgery and I'm, I'm the chief rehabber. <laughs> um, so we talked about that a little bit. So, do you have any, did you have any involvements with um, the scholarly field outside of UC? I didn't have much time for a lot of involvement. Um, my wife did, and she carried me along a good deal of time. Um, she um, was and is a great part of the Appalachian uh, Democrat, and she uh, was a delegate to the Democratic Convention in Florida in 1972. And her great sponsor is now the Vice Mayor of Cincinnati, David Mann, who are great friends with him. And you know who was nominated to it in 72? And Richard Nixon won a landslide election, I think. A Democrat only took two states at that. And two years later, uh, he was, had to resign. George McGovern. George McGovern was a classmate of Tom Bonner. Um, and then she was an assistant to the mayor in certain, in, when he became mayor later. And he appointed me to the Bicentennial Commission as a historian for Cincinnati. In 1988. And um, have you ever been to Bicentennial Park downtown? That's one of the most visible thing. There's many parks down there. Now you've been there. Yeah. If you'll go in, there's a brick to those who are on the Bicentennial Commission and my name is on one. Let's make sure I go. <laughs> and then uh, Dottie was uh, editor of the Cincinnati Heritage Magazine, Cincinnati History. What, 20, 25 years? I don't know. So uh, I kept in contact with the city a good deal that way. And then she worked for the Legal Aid Society. You know what the Legal Aid Society is? I don't, I'm sorry. The volunteer lawyer, she was the organizer of that to help the poor and those that need legal assistance. And then after that, she still is a member of home. You know what home is? <laughs> I think you get me. No. Housing opportunities made equal. Okay, the I city. do know what that is. She was president of that for a while, and still an important board member of it. So she pulled me into mm -hmm. some of those activities. Okay. But I tell you, it's a full-time job here. <laughs> okay. uh, and when did you retire from UC? 98. Okay. Um, are you still involved with UC academically beyond your retirement, were you? Not so much academically, but I'm a member of the Maritime Board, okay. which is sponsoring this. And I give a lot of money, I can tell you I have. Okay. <laughs> <It's just like> <laughs> <laughs> and we'll probably get more if, if we all behave. Well, thank you for allowing uh, Tao and I to uh, interview today, and we really appreciate your time. I'm grateful. Okay. As an old historian, you know you have to you learn if you don't know. You have to take a lot of this with a grain of salt, and as you particularly the factual part, unless you verify it with others. So reminiscence is not exactly history. It might give a tone to it, a, 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 a sense of how people felt, but it, it, it's not historically uh, totally valid until you can corroborate it with other sources and so on. Am I right? In, indeed, exactly. <laughs> I, I have to say that listening to you, listening to you talk today, help me help enrich my knowledge well of you and of the department uh, and i think you, that kind of you, you, i think you said um, it, it gives you a flavor of, of yeah. the history and so going back and forth between these reminiscences that provide a really valuable flavor and then you know nailing down the facts with you know we were at 
the UC archives yesterday, and Kevin showed us how to, um, you know, do research in, in the university archives. Going back and forth between the oral histories and the university archives will provide, you know, both the factual stuff and, you know, the very rich personal reminiscences. I had such a hard time at the university being Dutch Provost, a president that was not good. And all those papers are in the archives, but it's just too bitter of an experience for me to go back to look at them. I'll have to maybe one of these times. Mm -hmm. If you people want to look at them, do it. See if there's anything in there that <laughs> you want to call me about or talk to me about, I'll be happy to. Great. I think that'll help. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll bet I was quicker than Barbara. <laughs> yeah, just pushed that.